afternoon and welcome to the Reflective Coach Podcast with Coach Luca. You're able to find the Reflective Coach Podcast on YouTube, Anchor and Spotify. You're also able to find it on LinkedIn and Twitter. We have a wonderful episode with Noel Cole Robertson, professional soccer player who has had an amazing career to date with fantastic accolades that have led to her making history within the female game. This history isn't spoken about enough and if it was in the male game then we'd be hearing all about it. But because it's in the female game, we haven't heard enough about these accolades and it's a fantastic insight that Nicole has been able to share with us and that I'm able to bring you through the Reflective Coach podcast. It's fantastic to talk about and highlight these accolades on Nicole's fantastic career and she has worked so hard and has been thoroughly deserving of everything that she's achieved so far. She is from California, USA, a fantastic area within the US, going on and leaving to go abroad to explore her wonderful journey and have these fantastic opportunities that have arisen. She was born on 28th of June 1996 and piqued an interest within soccer from a very young age. She has worked very hard going on to university, achieving a degree and having fantastic experiences along the way. She currently places in an attacking position. She likes to play out on the wing and can play as a striker, in which time she has become joint first place top goal scorer in the first division in 2019. Nicole has had fantastic experiences out in Denmark and Glasgow City in Scotland. She has also been out to Sweden and isn't afraid to continue travelling for her fantastic career and continue to develop these accolades that she's been achieving. Along the way, she will continue to develop those experiences and become a better player in the hope of working and being achieved in a, a call up to the US national team. These accolades talk about being the first paid female transfer in Danish history. She was the first female contracted player at B93. She was the first contracted female player at Nordsjælland, which led to her being the first female contracted player at three different clubs. That is an amazing achievement within itself. Just talking about that and highlighting the impacts that Nicole is making at each of those clubs and around the world and going abroad and making history is not spoken about enough. And I can't wait to highlight the insights into Nicole's fantastic career so far in this episode. And I hope you continue to follow along with Nicole's fantastic hard work and great career. She was also top goal scorer for the first division in 2018 and she led to... As part of Glasgow City, she was Scottish Women's Premier League champion in 2020-21 season. She was also the first contracted female player in Division 1 with Vilberg and went undefeated with B93 following relegation to Division 1. Although a relegation, having an undefeated season showed relentlessness of working hard, that resilience and pure focus on achievement. Along the way, she has played Champions League football, which is another fantastic experience and a great career highlight of that developing and successful player. Nicole was a great interviewee. I hope you enjoy this episode. Please listen along and give Nicole your greatest support within her career. Thank you very much to Nicole and look forward to this episode. The Reflective Coach Podcast with Coach Luca. You know, only stick to one sport and see if I like it or not. But professionally, that started when I was 20 in the early, um, yeah, two, I think it was 2017. I moved to Denmark for a professional contract. And when starting out and playing all those different sports, do you feel that you learned skills and, and other applications that you could apply into into soccer? Yeah, definitely. I think a lot of sports that involved using my hands like baseball or American football and things like that really helped with more athletic abilities within football itself. You know, and that's great to hear that transfer of, you know, skills because you have so many young players and those entering the game. And then it comes to certain times when um, they haven't played any other sport and they're asked to do it within a, in a coaching setup. Like, for example, mm -hmm. I've coached boys and we use netball as a good warm up as a way of trying to use those hands to get into positions where they can and cannot move, how to increase teamwork and something away from football that allows them to you know, develop all those skills um, and then suddenly they, they lack skills which they didn't realise they had because they've never played those types of sports. Yeah, exactly. Exactly what happens. 
And when you went on to, you know, obviously build on your experience and you, you, you became professional at 20 and then went out to Denmark, was it a real difficult thing to leave the US and then go across to Denmark? I wouldn't say it wasn't difficult only because the university experience that I had was not very good. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, it wasn't very good due to, you know, like every coach has an opinion about you and other players and they are the final deciders on who plays and who doesn't. And I went to two different universities to play football on scholarship and neither one was an atmosphere I wanted to be in. So I knew that deciding to go to Denmark, I wasn't really losing anything. I was gaining something of myself. And when you became unhappy at those points and, you know, found those difficulties in a sense of everything that surrounded it, did that demotivate you at any point to, you know, stop playing or, or feel that it wasn't going in the right direction and maybe to look at something else? Um, it didn't demotivate me. It just made me realize how certain systems are in um like what I was in so if I knew I was experiencing these things within university sports then why would I keep playing university sports and that's like the decision you have to make yourself is it worth moving to a different country you've never been to to pursue something that is kind of unknown you don't know how it works or do I stay in school and be miserable on the same team that I'm in you know so when it comes to things like that, it's about kind of finding other options. You become demotivated when you feel like you have no other options out there. But the motivation comes back when you do reach out to people who can help you and find other options for you and start like a new chapter of your life. Absolutely. And, you know, when you went out to Denmark and, you know, have been, you, you played for three different clubs in Denmark, I believe. So obviously you, you're quite a big fan of Denmark. Is that somewhere, you know, you, you would, you know, if the opportunity arose to, you know, stay out long term or to move back to, would you go back to Denmark long term? I've actually played on six different clubs in Denmark, so I've been everywhere. But um, if I were to get offers back, I don't think I would go back due to I've already been there for so long. And I feel like I've kind of met the max time of my time there, meaning you know, you can only develop so much within the same system. And I feel like every country is different with how they work and every league is going to be different. So having the opportunity to um, experience different leagues in, within different countries is going to build you more as a player because now you're gaining different types of styles of play and coaches and culture itself. So I feel like a lot of growth has happened going from different countries. Um, yeah, so I hope that answered that. <laughs> no, of course, you know, that's a great answer and, you know, great little insight. And building on that, you, you've also, you know, gone out to Scotland. How, how was your time out in Scotland? Um, that's, I mean, it was only for nine months. And I think the best part of it was getting that Champions League experience and winning the league. Um, but when it comes to things outside of winning, the league and experiencing Champions League, I don't think it was a place where I actually grew as a player, but I went through some personal things where I did grow as a person. So that aspect was good. Um, but the Scottish League is not something I would probably go back to um, due to what I've already experienced there. You know, and, you know, even from the male perspective in, in terms of that, when you hear professional footballers, you know, the Scottish League isn't, you know, always for them or, you know, they wouldn't usually tend to pick out to go back there and, you know, make that move out there. So, you know, you can I can completely understand from that perspective as well. But during your time there, you went on and won a, a league. What What is that feeling when you win that league and you've, you've made that accomplishment? I think because it's not the first league I've won, but it is the first league I've won, like within the top league of that country. And, and I think it is a good feeling, obviously, because all the hard work has paid off. And um, during the last few weeks of the league, I was in, coming from injury. So being able to even play a little bit at the end and come back from an injury and win the league was a really good feeling. 
Um, but when it came to like competition within the country, there's not a lot of it. So I feel like there's this feeling of, yes, we won the league, but like how easy was it or how hard was it in the whole sense of it? And, you know, it's, it's great that you've won accolades abroad and, you know, it's certainly building up on your CV. And, you know, you've been here, you've done that, you've won leagues, you've experienced different cultures and you've moved away. You've overcome any challenges which you faced. You know, even just moving abroad is a challenge in itself and a complete change and can change you as a person and as a player again, you know, fitting into those systems and continuously adapting, but still finding moves and having those opportunities and you know it only builds on you know your sense of character and your your hard work but when you went away from the US and then moved out to Denmark and you, your other moves around the world is it have, have you found it difficult being away from family and, and, and that sense? I don't think it's difficult to be away from family when your family is there to support you I feel like or also, like, I feel like I am developing as I move and I have that support from my family to do so. I think it is so much harder when you don't have that social support from family or even like your close friends to gain those experiences because then, you know, you're moving to something so unknown and you don't want to be alone in that. So for me, it's not hard, but some people can have a huge challenge of it, especially depending on your age as well when you're super young. You don't know what's happening or you don't know what to expect. Whereas as you grow older and you gain those experiences, you know what's going to happen or what you should expect when you move from club to club. And, you know, it, when you sort of go out to those, you know, different countries and, and again, different clubs, and you have to form those new relationships with, you know, people that you've never met and new teammates and try to forge your own way in it and, and become recognised in that, in that because you, you can be seen as an outsider coming in, um, you know, at times. Is it really difficult to forge those relationships when you go abroad and try and fit into that environment and, and team? I don't think it's hard or forceful. I think it's... It becomes easier um, because you're always with them. So there's always a chance to build a bond with someone, especially when it comes to you're consistently training together and playing games and you build the sort of chemistry on and off the field in the locker room and stuff like that. So I think there can be difficulty when there is an age gap between the players, as in, you know, the young ones stick with the young ones and the older ones stick with the older ones because of maybe um, interest levels and stuff like that. So maybe that can be a little difficult depending on the personality of the players as well. So I think it definitely depends on, you know, culture, age and experience when it comes to kind of incorporating yourself into the culture. I think if you're not willing to submerse yourself into the culture, then it's going to be so much harder for you as a person to even get comfortable with the new atmosphere that you just put yourself in. And in that sense, you know, even if you had a player who was, um, you know, willing to give everything to that culture and be part of it. Is it difficult at times to have a player like that? But obviously knowing that the, the pay in the female game isn't amazing and there are at times, especially for young players, they have to work a, a second job to try and, you know, make something of their career. Is it difficult then to try and get that player more involved because they're, they're a bit more stretched and they're, they're trying to balance everything? Right, that is that is difficult for women players, especially since we have to balance school and jobs and life and all that stuff. And I think it depends on how the culture of the club handles that. If the coaches are understanding of stress and schedules and things like that, then they can work with the player to not make it so stressful. But if there is no understanding and there's these high expectations that aren't being met, then it can cause some strain within the culture of the team and for the players themselves. So I don't think it's like, I don't think it's more, I think it's more depending on the club and how they handle those things. And, you know, um, the, the, the adversities, you know, that, every footballer faces and you know certainly in the female game I think there's a few more adversities 
um, than in the male game at times because there's so much unseen behind the scenes that players give up and everything that they go through, such as moving abroad, living at home, uh, away from family, you know, sometimes, you know, that, that change of culture um, and everything behind the scenes, which the fans don't usually tend to see. Um, do you, at times when that pressure comes about or any criticism from the fans, because we're not going to have the most amazing game every game, is that difficult then to sort of comprehend and deal with considering how much you're giving up at times to play for them in front of them? Yeah, I think I think it is hard for fans to comprehend because they probably think that, you know, top female players are making the same as men or at least close to it when it's not the reality whatsoever. You know, some professional women clubs can't even provide a place for the girls to stay in. And if it is, it's not very good. It's not clean or it doesn't have a lot of furniture in it or they have to commute an hour just to get to training. So when it comes to all these added stresses, then it is hard to perform because now you don't have like the stability or sustainability to even be your own person outside of the sport. So that's why girls have to go to school or get a job because, you know, some girls get 200 pounds a month and what else are they supposed to do? They can't live off of that. You know, so fans just expect that they make at least a thousand, two thousand, and they're able to support themselves when that's not the reality of it. No, absolutely. And, you know, that, that's been a, a big theme in, you know, in terms of all the female soccer players that I've interviewed this week. Um, and, you know, it's something that we've discussed and the extensiveness of it. Um, and one player that we've sort of mentioned is Alex Morgan. Obviously, she's, you know, been at the top of the game. She's had those moves abroad and she's earning, you know, quite a lot of money in contrast to players, you know, even at a good level. Um, and, and, you know, as you say, what they're getting paid and, and you mentioned a really good word, sustainability, you know, if, if the, you know, for girls, you know, and, and women, when they sort of get older and they're, they're making those choices to go, right, I want to start a family or the opportunity has arisen to start a family and I want to bring up a child. It's not as sustainable for them because of that pay and, you know, how do they even balance it in that sense as well, you know? Yeah, exactly. And now it comes to um the rules and regulations or laws within different countries because now you have some countries who don't give that long of maternity leave and then you have countries who give maternity and paternity leave for both parents so now you have to decide which country you want to play in due to um now the support you get from the government in case those things come into play like if a player gets pregnant or you know, something else happens, an injury or sickness. I feel like a lot of those things aren't considered when it comes to female players because men can have children or start families, but they're not the ones carrying the child. They're the ones making the money for the family. And they can do that because they get millions and they can make sure their wife has all of, or their partners have all of the support and, you know, stability they need when it comes to starting a family and stuff like that. And, you know, it's, it's it, again, it's, it's those things that the fans don't see is you either put your life on hold or you give so much up to, you know, finally, you know, have a child or start your family and because those opportunities have arisen. And even at the sense of when you have your child, you, you're missing out on so much and they're missing out on so much because you're, you're playing and giving those commitments first. And, it, you know, how many fans are giving that up? And, that, and that's what they don't see. And that can be really difficult around a footballer in any sense. Yeah, exactly. And I think the fans also don't understand is that most female players can't really go abroad without another source of like financial support, whether that's from family or another job or, you know, if they have money saved. And I think that's the biggest thing that most people don't understand is that people can't really chase their dreams as a female professional footballer because of that financial issue that we kind of face every day no, absolutely and and you know when it comes to contracts and you know being offered the contract and you know being in those negotiations it, are they quite difficult at a sense in terms of you know clubs and managers are trying to squeeze players for as much as possible yeah i think it can be um i think it can be a big issue within i, I want to say it just depends on the club itself because you know especially because of COVID, a lot of sponsors have gone out and now a lot of clubs are losing money. So 
now everyone has to be smart with what they invest in and who they bring in and obviously players outside of the eu are more expensive because we have to have work visas to even stay in the country so now you have to kind of strategize okay is this person even worth the extra money to bring in and i feel like in the future it shouldn't really be like that it shouldn't be a, a you know is she worth it and it's not even that much like legally in some countries you only need a thousand dollars a month so it's just kind of strange to know that you know a thousand dollars a month for a player and for her to use that money to financially support herself and have an apartment and get to training and then possibly get another job because that may not be enough for her like i it that's what the whole issue is is kind of the money thing because men can move get 500 a month and then it's fine because they have a place to stay and they have enough to support themselves no and you know it's again those difficulties which aren't seen by everyone um but when it comes to negotiating a contract with the success that you've had you know winning league titles playing champions league football um you know being a top goal scorer and, and you know all those accolades which you've you know been very successful to achieve does that you know help you when you negotiate a contract and try and you know earn more money um i think I think it depends again on the coach and the club because maybe, you know, say because I did win the league in Scotland, but maybe the Scottish league isn't as good as winning the German league, for an example. You know, so sure, you won the Scottish league, but how good is that league? So me using that to my advantage maybe is not a good um, selling point because say I'm trying to get into um, a league that may be ranked higher than Scotland maybe those clubs won't see it as like, you know, something as like, as in a big accomplishment compared to other leagues. And, you know, say you're from like a lower country ranked, but you go to, go to Champions League. Maybe some coaches don't see that as an accomplishment because you came from a low ranked league within a country. So I think all of that is very, like there's a lot of comparisons on that. And now it just also depends on your playing style. Like maybe all those things are great and the coach liked your playing style, so they want you. Or maybe you don't win anything, but they still like the way you play. Then you can still get signed. Now it's just based on opinion rather than like successes in some aspects. You know, and that's a great perspective and insight usually, you know, um, that a lot of people don't, you know, even think about in that sense, you know, that you are coming from a lower league and, you know, if you're going up to a higher league, it doesn't always work in your advantage because, you know, a lot of people do criticise saying, all right, they can earn so much money because they've won this, this and this. But when you put it in that perspective, you know, that, that that's a great insight to, you know, make a narrative for it. Yeah, and I think, I think that is a big aspect, especially when it comes to, you know, it is political in that way. And, you know, what have you accomplished? Are you on the national team of your country and things like that? And, you know, for me, I'm not the na on the national team of America and I haven't played in America since I was 19. So being seen by them is not going to be, um, it's not, you know, high chances of that. But I, I think I'll be seen more once I gain more success within leagues that are ranked higher even if I don't experience Champions League or anything like that, at least I'm showing well within the league I'm in. And I think having those personal accomplishments is really important too. No, absolutely. And, you know, um, I wish we the best, best of luck in trying to get on the international scene and playing up the higher leagues because, you know, it'd be a, a great accolade to, you know, even be called up to your country and be part of that environment. And, you know, even to try and get that cap and represent them and, you know, to be on that international level would, would be a, an amazing achievement. Um, and, you know, especially, you know, playing in position and, and scoring, um, it, you know, is, is a great asset to the national team. In that sense, you know, you play as, a, as, as an attacking player um, and you, you can play as a striker. Um, have you always started out as an attacking player when you started out football or, you know, when you were you're younger coming through university? Um, I've I've actually, <laughs> I've played around, like, you know, winger and centre midfield. I used to be a goalkeeper, but then I stopped growing, so then I changed that. <laughs> I And, you know, ever since I moved to Denmark, that's when I became a striker because I'm quick 
rather than be in the midfield. And um, I think, it, again, it just depends on the playing style of many coaches because in America, I was used as the playmaker in the midfield and the one winning all the headers and being aggressive. And now coming to Europe, I'm used as the one who can get in behind the defense and score goals and stuff like that. So for me, like, I like playing those positions, but when it comes to having, I don't have a favorite. I just rather play a position that will help my team. So if I am playing winger because there is someone who is better than me at scoring goals, then that's how it is. And they're in that position because of that. So I feel like, I feel like when it comes to playing, it just depends on how like, I'm being used. And I'd rather be used by the coach to like my benefit and the team's benefit. No, absolutely. And, you know, that that's, again, another great, you know, um, insight and, you know, that great commitment to your team and, you know, how unselfish you are. Because there are times when you get players, you try to put them into a team and, you know, you try to get them playing and suddenly you put them in a position and they're playing in that position for, you know, a frequent amount of time and it's not their first choice. And then suddenly they become unhappy because they want to play a different position, even though they're getting lots of minutes. Right. And it kind of shows that maybe that type of player isn't adaptable or coachable because instead of learning a new position and learning new skills in a different way of playing and seeing the field, and reading the game, they rather stick to what they're used to and what they're comfortable with. Of course, and you know that you know that that that's you know what they need to you know sometimes adapt to and have that openness, which you don't always find in every you know footballer. And it comes into that psychology. Um, and when it comes to psychology, do you have any superstitions um, when you play? No, I actually study it for my master's, so it's funny you mentioned that, um, but I don't have superstitions. It's more of kind of like a pre-game routine, as in, you know, you do the same thing before games because it's that routine that helps you get into that mental focus and either you need to relax your body because you're too hyped up or you need to hype up your body because you're too relaxed. So I think it's important for players to kind of find that routine for themselves and what helps them and you know some superstitions maybe do help the player mentally because it gives them that um that comfort in knowing that because they have that thing that it's going to help them win the game so it is connected mentally i just don't have like a certain superstition for myself <laughs> You know, and, and that's great because some, you know, some players do have superstitions, and you know, suddenly one big change, and it can affect them even before they go on the pitch, and then they got to, you know, really, really deal with that for ninety minutes. So, you know, um, trying to manage that and being aware of that is is really important, um, and how you take that into your game. Yeah, exactly. And again, like everyone's different, so everyone gets to find out what works best for them. And I, I research a lot of things. So it's more of me kind of trying out and, you know, trial and error what works and what doesn't work for me personally before games and even training. No, absolutely. And, you know, before, um, you know, I, I let you go and, you know, because you, you, you're so busy and you've got so much going on and, you know, you, you found the time to take, take out uh, this interview this morning. What three key takeaways would you give to any footballer, um, you know, starting out or looking to play? Like professionally or just to play for fun or what do you mean? Uh, let's go professionally. Um, three key things. I would say um, be adaptable. Like you want to show that you're willing to learn and grow as a person and a player. The second thing is, you know, put your mentality first and like yourself, health and worth. Because if you're not happy within the club, but you're giving it everything and you're still not happy then you need to put your happiness first and find something that will make you happy because you won't play your best if you don't feel your best and then the third thing is you know don't give up because everyone goes through those setbacks and they go through um, different things that may demotivate them but if you see you know, the light at the end of the tunnel and you can see it's only temporary and you fight through it and you find all the resources you need to get through whatever setback you're going through. Then just know like, that's just gonna make you stronger when you 
grow and not grow out of it, but you know, heal from what you're going through. You know, and brilliant there. Three great insights and three, you know, great takeaways there to set for any player, you know, um, especially those looking for professionally and coming from the insights and, you know, listening to just this episode and everything that you said and from your experience and what you've, you know, gone into and how you've adapted as a player and person, you know, it just encapsulates everything that you've just said there. But, you know, you've to date, you've had a fantastic career. Um, you, you know, you've achieved a lot and I hope you continue achieving. And I hope, you know, those opportunities and those moves uh, appear in the long run for you. And, you know, you, 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 you're you deserving of that because of everything that you've, you've faced and everything that you've overcome and everything that you've achieved. Um, and I wish you the greatest of luck in the future to come. Thank you so much. No problems. Thank you very much. Well, again, grateful for your time and uh, I hope you take care and I, you know, the rest of your morning goes well for you. Awesome. Thank you. And you too. Thank you very much. Take care. Bye. Bye.